Welcome to the Ideas Festival, everyone. Um, so we are going to have a conversation among the three of us uh, for a while, and then we're going to open it up to you all and look forward to hearing your thoughts as well. As you probably know, um, I am sitting with Christiana Figueres, a former UN official, um, who I asked her uh, what her title is, and she said, Faithful Servant of the Global Atmosphere, which is an excellent <laughs> title. Uh, and uh, on the far side, Todd Stern, who served as President Obama's chief climate negotiator, among many other things. So we are going to dive right in. Um, and I want to kind of acknowledge the, the negativity um, that there is around this topic. And, and even, I, I, I'm, I'm an optimist by nature, but I don't think hopelessness is even too strong a word in some cases. People feel extremely down about the fact that the climate situation looks both so serious and at least one major government in the world, the one of the country we were sitting in, seems to be actively working to make things worse. Um, and people are worried, is it even too late? <laughs> um, and so I, I guess I want to pose that question to each of you. Is it too late? Um, to what extent, when we see things like the increased um, melting of the Arctic, when we see the growth of extreme weather that quite clearly can be linked to climate change, things like extreme rain, even setting aside things that we don't know whether they're linked, like hurricanes. Um, what would you each say to someone who, who essentially has the attitude, it's too late, the carbon is baked into the system, um, and we are uh, headed for a world of, that is a lot hotter um, and a lot worse off, and it's not even clear that we can do much about it? Christian. I, I would say both yes and no. Here's the yes part. Uh, I think we have to be very, very clear and very honest about the fact that even if we completely, and in fact, even with acceleration, implement the Paris Agreement, we're not going to solve climate change. For that, we are too late. For that, we are too late because we already do have very, very dangerous concentrations of greenhouse gases um, in the atmosphere, and so we are now already saddled with uh, a certain level of climate disruption, of uh, impacts. Uh, all of you know the wildfires here, the flooding, et cetera, et cetera. I don't, I don't, I don't have to give you all of that data because uh, I'm sure you're aware of it. Um, so, so there we have to be very um, humble and understand that we will not be able to solve climate change, that to those effects that are already baked into the system, we are gonna have to figure out how do we adapt to them. Now, the other part uh, is that actually uh, the Paris Agreement never intended to solve climate change. What it intends to do is to shave off the worst impacts, to maintain us within what is said in the, in the Paris Agreement well below two degrees and somewhere closer to 1.5 degrees, which already has baked within itself certain impacts, but at least we know that we humans, that the global economy, that society can adapt to that. If we go to a world that warms more than two degrees, the insurance industry has already told us that is systemically uninsurable. That is a situation that we are trying to avoid. For the other situation of keeping us uh, within manageable risks, I don't think it's too late. We're actually almost at the closing door, but there is a little bit there. Uh, and honestly, we have to make every effort to, uh, to get us to, to that, uh, to, to being able to shave off uh, the worst effects. And here's the really interesting part. Doing so brings a huge number of opportunities. That's the piece that we tend to forget. Doing so means that there are many million jobs uh, that are created. China is investing now in renewable energies because they want to create 13 million jobs over the next two years. That's why they're doing it. Doing so means that we have much more energy independence uh, here in, uh, in, in in this state, uh, the uh, major utility has actually accelerated the closing of coal, coal plants and put in the largest renewable energy package um, because it saves money, because renewables are definitely now uh, cheaper than even installed coal. So the fact is that even if 
someone says to me, well, I don't really understand climate change. Fine, let's do it because it's actually good business. Let's do it because it's in our economic interest. It certainly is in our health interest. Uh, and it is in our social interest. So why shouldn't we do it? One small factual question before I ask Todd and answer the same question. On the two degrees, where are we right now? How much has the Earth warmed so far? One. It's one. A, basically one. Okay. So. so I have also a kind of uh, partial yes and no answer. I think fundamentally the answer of uh, is it too late to be taking strong action to try to get going full throttle on climate change, the answer is categorically no um, for a couple of reasons. First of all, I think it's not a sure bet. But I think we still have a chance to uh, get to that well below two degree goal that is embedded in the Paris Agreement. Uh, the second thing is that even if we try and we don't quite make that, we've got to go as hard and fast as we can to keep it as low as we can. Those goals matter. They are not some environmentalist dream of a, you know, of a, a sort of sky is falling scenario. Those are, they're real and significant and important. But we have to go full throttle to get below two, or even if we're not below two, to get as close to two as we can. So that's number one. The second thing I would say is that this is absolutely seen broadly. We're in a race against time. We have all sorts of really good things happening on the clean tech front. If you look at any of the projections on solar, on wind, on, on, on uh, battery storage, on all sorts of technologies, electric vehicles, and so many other things. Uh, if you look at projections that, the, that the, the, uh, the International Energy Agency in Paris was making, if the Energy uh, Information Agency and the US government were making in 2005, 6, 7, 8, 9, they have wildly missed how fast and how well we have done. So directionally, there's a lot of good news. The issue is that the bad stuff is happening just as fast, right? So that the impacts, what we see uh, on, the, on the science side, what we see in terms of heat, what we see in terms of uh, the new scientific projections on sea level and all the rest Melting. are also going fast. Mm -hmm. So the, the issue isn't that directional, directional, uh, directionally, uh, being directionally right is not enough. We need to be operating at the speed and scale that's required, and we're not yet. We're not yet because uh, outside of a fairly small bubble, there just aren't enough people, not enough leaders around the world who get it the way they need to get it. So moving in the right direction and we got to go faster. The reason we've been faster on things like wind and solar is just human ingenuity, I assume. Yeah. Why? Well, well and, and policy. And policy. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Subsidizing. Sure. I mean, uh, tax credits for, uh, for wind and solar and, uh, and uh, R&D investment and all sorts of things. Why has the and, and honestly, China really setting its mind, right, that they are going to bring down the price. China brought down the price of solar panels. China's bringing down the, pass, uh, the, the price of wind turbines. And they're doing so not to save their planet. They're doing it because they understand that this is good for their economy. They understand that in a low carbon economy, there is going to be an increasing demand for these technologies. And they want to be first. And they can export them then. And they are already exporting, yeah. of course. And why has the reality of climate change, you, you said the good news is the progress is faster than expected, the bad news is the effects. Is that because the interaction between um, carbon and the climate has, has been on the bad end of the spectrum? Why have things proceeded more rapidly in the bad way than, than oh, scientists expected? Oh, well, I mean, I, look, I think that, uh, that um, scientists have been, have been projecting uh, serious problems at you know in the range of two degrees for a long time. I, I just think that that the uh, that as it has happened, the scientific models when they say you know we're gonna be uh, we it looks like we're gonna be in the range of one to three feet of sea level rise this century, and then new science uh, discovers that gee the Antarctic you know the Greenland and Antarctica are, are where all the ice is, and that Antarctica which people thought, scientists thought, would not start melting because it's so damn cold down there. But guess what? It's melting from below. Okay, so these are, new, these are literally this year new, or within the last couple of years, new discoveries. Uh, and I think that, that uh, if anything, uh, heat and uh, the severity of storms and, uh, and, and droughts and fires and all of that have, if anything, just you know, a appeared more intensively than people than people even thought. But it's but it's not 
it's not sort of dramatically different than what they thought. I, I think we tend to underestimate the interconnectedness of all of these uh, of all of these effects. We we tend to think that you know you have wildfires over here, you have uh, droughts over here, you have flooding over here, you have melting of the glaciers over here. That's not the case. All of this is actually interconnected, and uh, and so the effect of one actually. Uh, has a multiplying effect on everything else. And once that gets multiplied, then it gets even more multiplied on the other side. So the, expon the, the interconnectedness and the exponential nature of change uh, is something that we tend to underestimate. And when you look at the other side of the ledger, right, the, uh, the solution space, we also have underestimated the exponential pace and scale that we can get to, that we've already seen. So, you know, if you stand back, you actually seeing two exponential curves that are trying to outbeat each other, if you know, you know? You have the exponential nature of the, uh, of the negative, you also have the increasingly exponential nature of the solution space, and the big question is, which one is gonna get there sooner? It's a more, both are more dynamic systems than yes. people realize. Can you, and with acknowledging there's huge uncertainty here, right? Can you just sketch out for us, because you've both obviously talked about this, you've read enormous about, amount of the research, what does a world look like in a quarter century where we stay at the two degree threshold? What, how does life change in parts of the world around the equator? Um, uh, what does the city of Miami or New York likely look like? What is the world likely looking like? In the best of all cases. In the, yes, <laughs> in, the best of, in the best of all and still not great case, right? 95th or 97th percentile case. Well, um, I, I've been recently, just to take two industries, okay, that I've spent some time with recently, uh, cocoa industry and coffee industry. Uh, and both of them, I'm not talking about some coffee farmers, some cocoa producers. I'm talking about the industry as a whole in its entire value chain understands that under those natural circumstances, let's say those circumstances, uh, we're under threat of not having any more cocoa in 40 years and not having any more coffee in 50 years. So that is, you know, that, that is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, now, I, I mean, I don't know how any of you feel about your grandchildren or your children not having coffee or chocolate available to them. More seriously, perhaps, is the fact that we will have uh, serious uh, sea level rise and that we have more than 40 low island states in the Pacific that are only a few centimeters over, over sea level today uh, that will lose their land. And uh, if you thought migration today is a problem, uh, we have 60 million migrants today in the world, 40 within their boundaries, 20 outside of their national boundaries. Well, I don't know how many zeros you would have to add to that. But the pressure of migration, right, in all of those islands in Bangladesh, uh, and I'm only talking now about developing countries, let us, you know, not to add to that the eastern or the, the low-lying coastal areas of all industrialized countries. I mean, honestly, we have not understood that we are really facing huge shifts here in the economy, the way we work with each other, where we live, who's gonna live where, what pressures we're gonna be under. This is, this is actually a huge deal, even if we stay under two degrees. Anything you wanna to add to that? Well, I, yeah, I, I think that fundamentally, uh, people, including scientists, don't really know that well. Um, I mean, I, I think that the premise of a well below two degrees being the target for Paris is that if you keep it at that level, the kind of worst impacts that, that could be imagined would be avoided. It, that might be true or might not be true, but I think that, that the, I mean, we have 50% of the world's population lives in cities and 50% of the cities are near coasts. And, uh, and if sea level stays at a relatively more moderate level, that's gonna be a much less uh, dramatic refugee kind of situation than if they get much higher. Will they stay at those levels if we can hold temperature to you know, 1.78, whatever? 
maybe. I mean, that's the, that's, that's the idea. I mean, that's the reason that, that, uh, that that's a goal. Um, but again, you just look around. We just have to look around us at the, and we, we tend to, if, if you're not in, in a climate bubble, you're tending not to look at uh, extreme weather all over the world in Thailand and the Philippines and Pakistan and, and Colombia and, and so forth. But if you look over the course of the last one, two, three, five, seven years, there is a ton of disruption going on every year now at one. So what does that mean when we get that much higher? We don't know, but again, the hope is that the more catastrophic stuff, uh, more sort of uh, widely spread will be avoided, but it's, I mean, it's hard to say. And what's so alarming is to think back to what you just said, Christiana, about the fact that these systems are more dynamic than we expected. Mm -hmm. It seems like at each tenth of a degree we go, it's very easy to imagine that there are effects that today we, we can't forecast. That it's the, not linear. It's not linear, mm -hmm. and there seems to be really substantial tail risk well before two degrees. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about politics for a minute. So, Todd, can you give us your assessment of what kind of damage the Trump administration is really doing here? What are the yeah. things that are mostly chest beating? What are the things that maybe people on the left have exaggerated how important they are? And what are the things that they've done that really have a tangible impact um, on climate, climate policy and the world we live in? Yeah, so I, I, let me divide the answer into an international side and a domestic side. I think on the international side, uh, it is, uh, it's quite damaging uh, in ways that might end up being quite important or maybe we'll manage to, to keep them not as important. One very good thing that, uh, that did not happen is countries did not, other countries did not say, uh, you know, we're getting out also. So everybody, everybody else is still there, that's good. Uh, the, the absence of the United States at a political level, which is to say at a senior uh, level, is uh, I think visibly felt. I've been to, uh, I was at the COP, uh, the, there's a big climate meeting at the end of every year, it's called the Conference of the Party. So I was there in Bonn in, in November. I also went to a so-called intersessional meeting of all the countries just last month. And, uh, and the absence of the United States is absolutely felt. There's, there are, there are uh, kind of follow-on implementing negotiations that are going on right now that are actually, they're a little weedy, but they're, they're actually quite important in terms of the way the regime will work. They're supposed to be done this year. There's a lot of countries kind of trying to pull back and kind of backslide from important compromises that were made in Paris. And it wouldn't be happening the same way if the US was there. The other thing is that Paris is based, so without going into a whole disquisition about Paris, the, the, a, a core thing to keep in mind is the country targets are not legally binding. The system of accountability of reporting and being reviewed on what you've done, that is legally binding, but not the targets themselves. And that was true because you could not possibly have gotten an agreement where all 195 countries had to agree, which is the way climate negotiations work if the targets were legally binding. But what that means, and so I think that's not only defensible, I think it was necessary, but what that means in effect is that Paris is built on a, on a theory of norms and expectations driving countries forward, driving countries toward those goals. There's, there are cycles built into the agreement to re-up your, your targets every five years and so forth. Uh, so, you know, those things are, uh, are enormously important, and if the United States is not in there, and the United States is not showing its own commitment, its own engagement, the likelihood that you're gonna get other countries doing their best and really knocking themselves out is just reduced. So that's on the, on the international side. And hopefully, countries will do what they should do anyway, and hopefully we'll have a decent so-called rule book uh, that gets negotiated this year, but it's dicey without the US. Um, on the domestic level, the Trump administration is basically trying to pull back on every important uh, uh, initiative that President Obama put in place, the Clean Power Plan, the, uh, the uh, uh, vehicle efficiency rules, sometimes called CAFE standards, uh, rules on uh, methane, which is not CO2, but it's the second big greenhouse gas and very important. So in all of those ways, they're trying to pull back. Many of those efforts are, are, are caught up in litigation right now. But, uh, but suffice to say, there is no, there's no 
you know, kind of onward dynamic coming from the federal government in the U.S., and that's certainly damaging. The positive side of that is that, that there was almost instantly a very broad mobilization of states, cities, companies, uh, civil society in response to uh, Trump's June 1st, 2017 announcement that he was going to withdraw. And that's helping, but, uh, but it's not going to get us all the way to the U.S. target that we took on in, in, in Paris. And so it's undermining, uh, it, it is both pushing fossil fuels forward as much as possible and uh, pulling back, pulling back on R&D, pulling back on everything that would be you know, constructive with respect to, um, to, uh, to action at home. The, the complementary way of, of seeing what Todd has just explained is that um, by the political announcement, because it's a political announcement, legally they can't uh, actually exit until after the next election in the United States. But in any event, the, the political announcement of uh, last June caused a rift on two levels. First, the very evident rift within the United States, where when you say, well, what is the United States doing on climate change? That is a obsolete question that should not be allowed to even be asked because you have the federal government and their political messaging, and then you have the real economy of the United States uh, represented by the states, the corporations that are actually moving forward. Uh, and as Todd says, obviously, if there were alignment, ideally, countries, and in most countries, you have an alignment between the federal policy and subnational policy and what is being done in the ground. But at this point in the United States, there is a huge rift between what is being said politically, both domestically and internationally, and what is being done in the real economy. So that's one rift. The other rift that has occurred because of that is that while most countries, in fact, the United States is the one singular only solitude country that is outside of the Paris Agreement in the entire world, and all other countries uh, are either in expectation of or they are actually pushing forward. China definitely pushing forward. India definitely pushing forward. The, Un uh, the European Union definitely pushing forward because of their own interests, right? But they're doing that domestically. They have a very difficult time to express that decarbonization that they are pushing for within their domestic economy express that at the international level, at the political level, because the United States is partitioned. And the, the political situation of the United States makes it very difficult for other countries to align their political message with what is really happening on the ground. So that makes it a very, very difficult uh, context uh, for those who are negotiating now because you know there are two realities. You know that what countries are saying in the negotiating table has very little to do with the reality inside the countries. But it is the, re the political reality that everyone is dealing with now. If China and India and the European Union are all really pushing ahead, are there countries other than the United States that are not really pushing ahead? Well, so I think that there's, uh, I'm, I'm sure there are plenty of countries who are not pushing that hard, but, uh, but I, and, and I, but I- But that make a material difference. Yeah, yeah but see, I, I think, I, I, I don't disagree with Christiana, but I guess I, I would have a little bit of a different uh, emphasis. I think that, uh, that there are countries that are pushing ahead, but they're not doing what they could be doing. Okay. And, uh, and I think China and India are both in that category. And, and, uh, and look, the United States at our best was in that category. So it, it, it's, I'm not, this is not a wicked criticism of them, but it, but it is an observation. Uh, and I, I was in also last month in, uh, in China for a week. And uh, I think that there's no question that, that there is an absence of their partner, right? I mean, Obama and Xi, and sort of starting at a lower, starting more at my level, and, and then going up to Secretary Kerry and, and the President, and, and the same on the Chinese side, really formed a, uh, a, part, a, a sort of partnership of, uh, I wouldn't say frenemies, but I mean, they were, they were partly friends. Willingness. Rivals. Willingness. But yes, but rivals, yeah. Yes. And, uh, and, uh, and the, 
there were any number of Chinese who told me while I was there last month that it's, it, it, it's not the same when our top leadership is not hearing that, feeling that push from the United States. So yes, they're acting, but, uh, and, and they're acting quite intensively with respect to clean energy for their local air pollution problem, for economics, and for climate change, all three. They're also engaged in a absolutely enormous uh, international infrastructure effort called the Belt and Road Initiative, which I believe is something like seven times the size of the Marshall Plan. It's enormous. Insofar as they help countries build coal plants outside of China, that's not doing their best from my right. perspective, that's and true. that sort of thing is absolutely going on. So there's, you know, the one other thing I would just say to, 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 just, to just kind of complete my earlier answer to your question is, it obvious on Trump, is it obviously is going to make a vast difference if this is a four-year adventure rather than an eight-year adventure. Yeah. And, uh, and when you think about when you think about kind of putting your foot on the brake rather than on the gas pedal in terms of progress, and then you go back to what Christian and I were saying earlier, that speed and scale are critical, well, put those two things together. It, 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 it's, it's a serious problem. Can the United States make its Paris targets um, if uh, Trump loses re-election? and the next president is a believer in climate yeah, science um, and takes action? I think that's an interesting question that people, um, you know, kind of uh, numbers crunching kind of people who are working on, uh, on an initiative called America's Pledge are trying to work through right now, trying to see, A, how far can we get over the course of the next few years on the back of whatever already exists at the federal level as well as states and cities and all that. And then what happens if we have a progressive president come in uh, and then can, 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 can kick things up further? Too early to I, I will say that the 26, our target is 26 to 28 percent reduction in greenhouse gases below 20, 2005 levels by 2025. That was our target. That was, a, that, was a, that, that was a stretch target to begin with and deliberately so. We wanted to push. Yeah. But we knew that the new president would have to come in and do still more stuff than Obama did to get there. So it was hard to begin with. I think, I think if, if, if you were betting on your question right now, you'd bet that, that that would be extremely difficult to achieve, but it's not impossible. And you also have exogenous you know, yeah. effects in the real economy that, that um, could make a huge, huge difference. Just because you use the word believe, can I say something Please. about that? Because it's one of my pet topics. I don't, I, I think the term believe in climate change should be prohibited. Okay. Um, because you don't say in common parlance, well, do you believe in gravity? Uh, <laughs> it's the same thing, right? I mean, climate change is not a belief, it's not a myth, it's not ideology, it is scientific fact, okay? Uh, and even if you don't believe in gravity, believe you me, gravitational pull is acting on you. Even if you don't believe in climate change, believe you me, climate change is acting upon you. Even if you believe the earth is flat, try as you may, you will never get to the edge and drop off. It's just, it's just so mind boggling to me that we still think that climate is something that you can either believe in or not. Now, do you understand climate science or do you not? I mean, if you choose to not, and many people choose to not understand because that's a choice, fine. Um, but it's either understand it or don't understand it. But it's not a, it's not a belief system. Yeah. That's actually a, a very good segue <laughs> into another political question I want to ask, which is, Look, I, I've yet to see around the world a perfect political party, right? Uh, every political party, I think, distorts evidence in different ways. If we were talking about different subjects here, we could talk about the ways that I think the Democratic Party sometimes does. It seems to me there is no other major political party in the world except for the Republican Party that, um, I'm trying not to get in trouble again, that rejects, <laughs> uh, that rejects climate reality, right? There are conservative parties all over the world um, that, that accept the reality of climate change. Um, uh, and there are debates about the best way to get there, and there, there are good policy debates about how much it should be through regulation, through taxes, through funding innovation. I mean, these are, these are all interesting subjects. 
and I'd be interested in both of your answers to this question, one more from an international perspective, one more from a domestic perspective. Um, but obviously, Todd, you spend a lot of time internationally. Why is the Republican Party the only major political party in the world <laughs> that rejects this reality? So that's a really interesting question. And, uh, and one, no, believe it or not, this is one that I've thought about um, you know, on and off uh, for a long time. I, just, uh, just as a factual point, the one other country Australia. That, has, that has experienced the kind of uh, not as much political divisiveness as the US and politiz politization of climate as the US, but still quite, ex extent, quite considerable as Australia. Okay. Mm -hmm. And two or three Australian governments you know, came and went over the climate issue, you know, during the time that I was there. Um, but look, I, I think that there are a number of factors that uh, that contribute to the, the kind of attitude of the of the party and a certain base of that party. Um, and uh, I think, and this is there's nothing scientific about this reaction, but I think that if you there's a certain amount of animus that I think dates all the way back to. Uh, literally to the 60s and the, and the sense of uh, the enviros were all kind of lefty pinko types. And uh, so I think that there's some of that kind of as a, as a kind of, you know, in, in the foundation. I think that there's some just inherent annoyance uh, among many people that environmentalists are, you know, whether it's snowmobiles or the snail darter or, you, you know, you can't eat meat or you can't do this or that, all, all these other things that, like, you know, real men can do and, and women, too, for that matter. Um, I think that that's uh, an annoyance that, that sort of relates to that first point. Then I think you move to the probably the more although that, I think those things are important. I mean, if you, if you go back and you look at, if you can stand it, if you go back to look at Sarah Palin's convention speech in uh, 2008, it was an effective speech. Uh, eight, right? Eight. Yeah. Um, you know, burn baby burn brought the house down. Right. Right? That was, you know, burn, burn your fossil fuels. Uh, and drill baby drill. Drill baby drill. Yeah. Burn baby drill. burn was. Drill baby that was drill. Different. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Drill baby drill. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I'll take that correction. Um, mm. And uh, and even Romney, you know, uh, milked the crowd with some you know sort of uh, jokes about uh, about Obama's uh, climate change fetish. So those that those foundations I was just describing, I think, are quite real and important. Um, but you also have the reality that that we have a. Uh, sort of political lobbying culture in the United States that I think is pretty different, maybe not unique, but pretty different, certainly pretty different from what you see in Europe. There's some of that, but nothing like, nothing to this extent. Uh, and you have a vastly wealthy uh, fossil fuel incumbency, which has a tremendous stake in being able to get their fossil fuels out of the ground. And if you look at what uh, the, I think, a fairly common kind of estimate of what a less than two degree goal would mean in terms of those fossil fuels, you get something like one fifth to one third of the fossil fuels in the ground can come out. That means four fifths to two thirds don't come out. That's a huge stake, right? So what you had, and I, you know, I got pulled into climate change when I was working for President Clinton, minding my biz own business, doing other things, but but asked to jump in in uh, July of 1997, about four or five months before the Kyoto meeting. And I dealt a lot with uh, businesses and labor and enviros and, and, and like that. And the, 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 the attitude uh, was very negative because of all this, you know, all the cost that was seen to be associated. And from labor's standpoint, you know, jobs and so forth. So you, so you had a lot of, you have a tremendous amount of wealth tied up in uh, in this issue, and that has in turn, going all the way back to the 20 years ago when I got involved, has in turn funded a tremendous amount of, uh, of research and communications efforts explicitly and deliberately aimed at creating a, uh, a, uh, a chorus of doubt. And, and, and there's just no doubt about that. I mean, documents in various 
I can't remember if it's from the press or lawsuits or whatever, but this is like real. This is not, a, this is not my fantasy. This is, this is documented stuff that, that and, and it goes on right now. I, I couldn't help, but uh, I, I spoke yesterday in a, in a, in a different uh, setting, um, but I, I couldn't help uh, note the irony. I, I was, um, uh, it was actually not where I spoke. I was, I was talking about an event that I attended from a, terrific NASA scientist who teaches at MIT now who was talking about the kind of Earth's vital signs as seen from space with respect to climate change. And her event was in the David Koch building. And I couldn't help but note the irony, the irony. because there's probably a substantial amount of the money, not only from them, but definitely from them and from a lot of he and his brother and, and, and from a lot of others who have been deliberately funding people who put out, you know, kind of faux research to say, you know, to, to, to make climate change seem to be a matter of belief that you might not believe credibly rather than what Christiana correctly said. Right. And then so I think all of those things put together, and, and so the, just I suppose the last point is I suspect that there are probably not more than 10 members of the Republican members of the Senate and a similar number in the House who really genuinely disbelieve that there is such a thing as climate change. And there's a much larger, there's probably 10, 15 or so senators, maybe more, who would be prepared to act if they did not see climate change as a third rail that would electrocute them if they, if they touched it. And then there's a larger, there's probably another number in the middle well, yeah, there's climate change, it's being exaggerated, but yes, it's real, but don't talk to me about it. So it's not like you have, you know, they, they talk to the base in, 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 in a way that's intended to say it's not phony. just the base, but to your point, they're donors, right? M some of whom s substantially yes. depend on Correct. extracting these. So I think, I, think it's, I think it's a combination of all of those factors, and it's not going to last forever, but the most important thing that could happen in this country is, is to, and, and I think you know, we gotta depend on the young more than anybody else, but, but on everybody, is that members of Congress need to know that they will be punished. Not just it's a free, it's a free, it's a free turn your head the other way. You'll be punished if you don't act, and we're not there. Christiana, which? Can I ask yeah. Todd a question? Please. Todd, in addition to everything that you've said, I, I've been wondering, since I'm not a US citizen, um, can we add to all of those factors um, the factor of the psyche of U.S. citizens? Because, you <laughs> know, know. It's, it's, it's very interesting to me that, um, I mean, with the exception of Australia, which I think is, you know, pre pretty, pretty different. But when you think about it, all other industrialized nations uh, were pretty powerful nations before the Industrial Revolution. The United States basically came into its being, into its economic power, on the basis of the Industrial Revolution, on the basis of fossil fuels, on the basis of everything that we have known over the past 100, 150 years. Um, and you know, when, when we non-US citizens think of the prototypical US citizen, we think of a big SUV, you know, going miles, you know, and, and certainly not, don't want the government to tell me anything about what to do about myself. Um, and I think there is part of the psyche there that this country came to be and understands itself consciously or unconsciously, as the child of the Industrial Revolution. Yeah. And now to be faced you know, with a new world, a new future that says, guess what? Industrial Revolution is coming to an end. We're going to build the museum to the, in to the internal combustion engine, and we're going to have a new, a new world. That must be somewhat threatening at a conscious, unconscious level? Well, I, so I actually think those are really interesting points. I don't know that I think so much that it's that Industrial Revolution Foundation, possibly. I do think another point you made in the context of what you were just saying is uh, a kind of individualistic, uh, leave me alone, let me drive my SUV, let me eat my meat, let me drive my snowmobile, just don't get in my face. I do think there's a bunch of that as well. And climate change, once you admit that there's climate change, well then, 
okay, so you've admitted it, you can't then ignore it, so what does that mean? You and have to do of, something about it. Kind of everything it means is, uh, is disturbing to a certain not small number of people. So I, I think that that's, those are. Last thing for me and then we'll open it up. You mentioned the young. Um, do you think that's the, the, if you look at the young's views on climate change in this country, right, it, it seems that they would favor a substantially more aggressive policy than we now have. That is also a, an extremely slow acting political force, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Extremely slow, mm -hmm. probably for this topic, too slow acting, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So what else could either of you envision as changing the politics of this issue in this country? And the one thing that occurs to me, and you may just think this is wrong, is actually the extreme weather. That, that um, if we continue to have increases in droughts, sea level rises in places like Florida, increases in extreme rains in places like um, southeastern Texas, and on and on and on, I could see that at some point. I'm not rooting for all kinds of yeah. unnatural disasters to happen, but I could see that changing the politics. Do you think that could? And if you don't, do you see any other force that could change the politics before today's 25-year-olds um, are 50? I, I think that definitely. Um, the, the more you know, we have uh, Katrina's, the more people understand. But also the other piece, I think, is the realization of the economic interest. I am fascinated by the fact that there are 17 Republican senators who have sent a letter and talked to uh, Mr. Trump asking him to send the Kigali Amendment to be ratified. The Kigali Amendment has to do with ozone, but it also has to do with climate change, and it's an amendment that was passed in order to um, reduce the climate effect of uh, refrigerants. Well, the reason why uh, these Republican senators are asking for that is because, you know, whether they believe in climate change or not is completely irrelevant to that conversation. They're doing so, and they're arguing that the um, technology that is being developed for a hotter world that needs more cooling uh, is going to be developed by those countries in which this has actually occurred. And they're arguing if the Kigali Amendment does not go into effect, and it needs the United States to go into effect, then the industry in the United States will not benefit from that demand, that industrial demand. And the industry in the United States is better placed than any industry in the world to actually be able to supply the United States, but also many of the countries that need to move to newer technology. It is just better placed. And, um, and, and so it's very interesting to me that these Republican senators are saying, do send this for ratification. We are going to be there to support it because of economic interests of the United States. And the same argument can be made actually about renewable energy, about solar, about wind, about batteries. Uh, the same argument can be made, but it hasn't quite hit the turning point. So I'm gonna be looking at this to see, you know, does the Kigali Amendment hit that flipping point and does it have any effect on the other technology? So, yep. you know, independently of climate, it's about economic opportunity. Economic development could be another thing. Yep. So, um, maybe a few, a few related points. First of all, I do think that the, uh, the drumbeat of extreme events uh, is having an impact already. I mean, the, 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 the poll numbers, I think, uh, uh, bear that out. The poll numbers have probably sagged in certain places under the influence of Trump, but still pretty good. Uh, and I think when people go through Sandy, when people see Hurricane Harvey, when people see the drought in California, and on and on and on, I think those things have real impacts. The second thing sort of related to that is that the time is going to come, and it's not going to be 30 years from now. It's probably going to be, I don't know if it's going to be five years from now or four years or, or 11 years or what, but, it's, it, but, but property values are going to start to fall in places that are exposed, like in Florida. Um, the, the capacity to get, uh, to get insurance, um, whether, whether uh, uh, residential or, or commercial kind of insurance, uh, is going to be limited, or the rates are going to are going to reflect uh, the risks that uh, that are that are there. Uh, and there's uh, still another effort that I think 
is a little bit roundabout, but I think not so roundabout, uh, that was launched by a guy named Mark Carney, who's the president of the Bank of England, a Canadian guy, actually. Uh, and he gave a, a sort of famous speech in the fall of 15 or 14, um, where he talked about the importance of disclosure uh, getting into the marketplace, uh, into the market, um, because uh, disclosure of carbon risk. Uh, because what he feared, he, I'm sure he feared extreme weather too, but the, pur the purpose of his speech was what he feared was what uh, is called in, uh, in, I guess in market circles, a Minsky moment where you have a dramatic and sharp drop of asset values where people have been not factoring in carbon risk uh, for, for the heavily carbon uh, involved companies and they go, they go, they go, they go, and then there's a moment suddenly when it drops. So, he, so disclosure is meant to have carbon risk start to, be, uh, start to be reflected in market prices. And that's, again, that's a little bit of a secondary uh, impact to get to people, but that's still, at, I, I think that that could be uh, important also. I guess the very last thing I would say is uh, there is a piece of this which just has to do with better communications than we have had to date. There have been a million efforts to communicate the right way to, to, uh, to people. I, I have sort of come to the view, as we've all lived through the last couple of years, witnessed the degree to which this is, uh, our country is very much uh, uh, in this new age of media and the internet and so forth of more and more tribal countries. I think the messengers matter as much as the message and we need to get the right messengers, farmers talking to farmers and, and uh, you know, uh, 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 people from labor talking to, you know, the right people talking to the right people. And there are enough folks who could be, who could be spokesmen who believe in this issue and who could potentially I think talk to their constituencies, yeah, in a in a in a better way. But, <laughs> but having said that, this is the hardest problem. Yeah. Communication. This, I mean, the 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 rocket science rocket science isn't rocket science. Human human yes. attitudes are rock. That's what's rocket science to move people, to move politics, to move political will. Yep. I mean, it, it, at the level of innovation, at the level of policy, at the level of being able to afford what we need to do. Check, check, check. We can absolutely do all these things, and demonstrably we can do all those things, and you need the politics and the political will, and that's where we fall down here, but also the rest of the world is, is better, but not good enough. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Get some questions. Do we have a couple mics going? Got one right here. Oh, great. Thank you for your point about... Uh... Tell us who you are, and I should have said, please tell us who you are and ask a question. Okay. Mm -hmm. My name is Jim Chafin. Thank you for a, a terrific uh, uh, program I've been concerned with and involved in uh, uh, climate change and environmental sensitivity throughout my career in the real estate world. I appreciated your question or your point uh, about uh, whether or not there is climate change. I have otherwise enlightened friends caring uh, and again, enlightened friends who will acknowledge, okay, Chafe, okay, okay, give, give it up. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll acknowledge there is climate change. But you have no proof as to what's causing it. And they keep coming back to that. Why, would, why should we be doing these things when you have no actual proof as to what's causing uh, the change? To which I say, well, do you have health insurance? Yes, well, why? Well, do you have home insurance. Yeah, well, why? You, you don't have any proof that something's going to happen. So I'm just wondering how you answer the question when somebody says, okay, I acknowledge there's climate change, but we have no scientific proof as to what's causing it, or at least that's what they think. Yeah. Uh, actually, we, we do. I, your point on, on insurance is a, is a very good point because uh, we do buy insurance for many things that we assume are never going to happen, but just in case we want to do it. And, and we haven't gotten to that maturity with, uh, with climate change. But there is scientific proof on climate change. Um, admittedly, as we have discussed up here, it is shrouded in a lot of uncertainty. But the fact is that uh, since records show 
we have not had the kinds of concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere that have gone literally like this over the past 140,000 years um, and have had exactly the same rise uh, in temperature. And both of those curves have gone have gone side by side, and we do know that that is what is causing all of the uh, all of, all of the disruption uh, in the climate and and in every other natural system. So there is proof. There is scientific proof. What we don't have is not the science proof of what it uh, what has caused it in the past. What we don't have certainty about is to what extent is it going to affect us by when and how much? So the projections into, into, the, into, the, um, into the future are very much based on what the scientists call modeling, uh, which at a big global level are a little bit uh, more confident, but the, the more you get into specific areas, um, then you'll have less confidence. But we do have scientific proof of the past. It's just that the modeling into the future is much more complicated. Um, and it's a refreshing panel already in the sense that um, I haven't heard the word solve the climate crisis as if this is a fixable problem. It was great to see, Christiana, you uh, move in that direction. Uh, Andy Refkin, sorry. This is my 30th year writing about global warming. <laughs> this is the anniversary, actually, this week uh, after Jim Hansen's testimony. So I've it, is, it is, it is, uh, it is. Uh, yeah, um, and I'll be on some other doing some of the discussions here. But the thing that, that I learned that I, it took me 20 years of the 30 years to learn is the importance of the social and behavioral science, which says that actually um, what you say about the climate science, Christiane, is absolutely true. <laughs> Greenhouse gases function, and et cetera. Sea levels are rising and will rise for centuries to come, et cetera, et cetera. But the choices that we make are framed by our values and reflexes. And it, it took me until 2006 to get into that science, and that's when I, as a journalist, where you think more information matters, you start to realize mm, that's not the case, especially when an issue becomes polarized. There's this one phrase to Google for, cultural cognition. There's a guy at Yale who has crystallized this. Um, but that leads to opportunities, and, and the, when, when Todd mentioned communication, and that, what was great about that first question was it was a conversation. And I'm at National Geographic now, just started there, and part of what I want our media innovation team to work on is facilitating conversations that can transcend some of these boundaries. And the best thing that seems to be, the, the best way forward seems to be to split it into component parts. Mm. Vulnerability reduction. You know, there are libertarians and liberals who came together to have a rational flood insurance policy. Then, then it kind of unraveled for complicated reasons. S Semi-rational. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and energy policy, a, a great CNN uh, correspondent went to the most skeptical county in America on global warming in 2015, and he interviewed a guy who said, What's your question? <laughs> it's a comment. It's, it's actually, it's, it's a reflection. Uh, sorry, you know, 30 years gives me some, and I've been uh, coming to Aspen festivals for 10 years. So. <laughs> At any rate, do you, do you think we've adequately gotten that message? Maybe this is a good news moment, I think. It's what I see in Paris and what I see when the way you're talking, saying is, it seems to be a good news, that it's a reflection that this is a journey, not a, not a fix. Uh, that, I think, is true, but, um, but all of the other problems that, that, that we've talked about uh, earlier today uh, in terms of what needs to be done and the scale and speed uh, are also true. But, but yeah, I, I completely agree with your, with your notion about framing. And I think some people still say, let's, you know, we, we're going we're to solve the crisis and others don't. But, uh, but I think that's worth taking. But you still have the other problems. Way in the back here. My name is Barry Herman. I'm from New Orleans. Katrina territory. Uh, one thing you didn't mention that concerns me is that if God wills it, then it's, you know, nothing we can do about it. That's an attitudinal problem that's, uh, I think, pervasive for this particular issue and many others. And what I'd like to hear from you is what the polls show about the hope of our uh, millennials who mobilize and I hope will mobilize and go to the polls and vote on issues like this. And you have 
polling on that on this, and I'd like to hear about it. Well, I, I actually don't have polling data right, like in a, in a very concrete way at my fingertips. But I do, I do have a general, uh, a, a general understanding that the numbers, which are already good and trending better in general, are even better among younger people. And I couldn't agree with you more about the need to mobilize, mobilize millennials. Uh, if millennials had been adequately mobilized, we probably wouldn't be sitting in quite the same posture that we're in now if that had happened uh, in 2016. So I think that's critical. Um, the voter turnout rate of voters between 18 and 24 in the last midterm was below 20%. Yeah, right. Exactly, and and uh, we're looking at a very important midterm right now, and then we're gonna, we're looking at an enormously important election in 2020. So I think uh, I agree with you. I guess one other thing I would just note: it's different, of course, uh, but the issue of how attitudes change, how attitudes change at the social level, is uh, I, it's probably a fascinating one as a matter of study, but it's also a, as a practical matter in concrete terms, unbelievably important. And uh, climate change obviously is different from uh, an issue like same-sex marriage, but, uh, but there you saw an absolutely stunning shift in public attitudes in the United States over a relatively very short period of time. I mean, you, it, you, people will, it, it, it's amazing to think that in the Democratic primary in 2008, neither Hillary Clinton nor Barack Obama supported same-sex marriage. Uh, so I think that, they're, again, they're very different issues, but I think that it, it is at least possible to imagine, to dream of the notion that, uh, that, uh, uh, that a tipping point can come. Uh, probably driven by the kind of bad events that you were talking about earlier, David. So the last polls that I saw in the United States say that 84% of people in the United States understand what climate change is and understand that we're under FX of climate change, but less than 50% are willing to vote in an alignment with that. So that's a very interesting, a very interesting uh, gap there. Um, with respect to, to millennials, my sense is that, um, that they're not willing to be politically active on this or many other issues uh, for, for many different reasons, where they are being very, very selective is trying to figure out who are they gonna work for and what products are they gonna buy. So I think that they are really beginning to shift uh, the demand of products and services over to low carbon, in fact, responsible products and services in general, and also being very discerning about what companies are they gonna work for. Frankly, they don't wanna work for companies that are just crap companies that are not being responsible on environment, social, and governance issues. And they're being much, much more discerning. And what is fascinating to me is the awareness of CEOs. I have talked to, I don't know how many CEOs in this country and in others who understand this and understand that if they want to be able to attract the best and the, bri and the brightest, they have to be much more responsible. So they are having a, a, a mark on this, uh, perhaps not through the voting booths. What would you, setting aside voting, um, and we're almost out of time, what, what would you encourage individuals <laughs> like all of us to do in order to make this issue a larger priority for our society? What can, what can people do? Well, so uh, let me take a crack at that. Uh, I think I, I, I don't, I wouldn't go in the direct, obviously this is useful also, but I, I'm mostly not focused on uh, turn the lights off and get, maybe get the good car is a good thing to do. But, okay. um, uh, but uh, if, if you're making sort of significant uh, decisions that, that are lower high carbon, it's good to have that in mind. But I think first of all, uh, to absorb into and internalize into your own consciousness the level of, uh, of importance that this has and the level of urgency that this has, it's not, I mean, there are other things that are also hugely important, but we cannot just let this go because the cost of letting this go would, would be astronomical and would truly change the world for our kids and grandkids and so forth. So A, get it in your own head. B, you're not gonna become a, a, a you know, a, 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 a going on parade with, uh, with all of your, uh, your friends, but in the, but in the, in the context of, of, uh, of ordinary social interactions, 
try to be you know mindful of uh, of that and then and then I think you do have to come back to the to the to political engagement you need to have the right people uh, in, in in Congress um, so I guess those are the things that I think of the most Christiana any last word yeah I, I would I would agree with that I would also say voting in the booth and with your wallet I really think mm -hmm. that this is not just the agree, supply agree side, it's also the demand side. And, and corporations really do react to the changing shifts of demand that, they, um, that they're seeing. And right now, it's actually the food industry that is under the hugest uh, amount of change for environmental reasons, uh, but it shouldn't be only food, it should be also energy. And so I think, you know, to, to change demand and to join the millennials in their demand of, uh, of responsible products and services really does send a message. Okay. Yeah, and business, particularly business to consumer companies, they're feeling this right now. I mean, they are super conscious, many of them, about projecting and uh, uh, a, a green image and doing things that, that underlie that. So I, I agree with that point. I mean, it's clearly a deeply alarming situation. I mean, in many ways, is the single most alarming situation in our world today. But I think you've both given us lots of reasons for reasoned optimism and, and a sense of what people can do. So thank you both. Yeah, OK. Thank you. Thank you.